I remember one time, um, so I got a Peloton and I was like trying to sneak, I just looked in the ride in the middle of the work day. And then I got a call uh, from one of my students. I was like, hey, can you take this um, prospect call, discovery call? I was like, sure. And I had to have my camera. I'm just drenched in sweat, like my full like Nike <laughs> pro combat. <laughs> the facade go, like the facade completely crumbles when your mom like walks in behind you with your, with your lunch. <laughs> and, and then you're like, it's like, oh. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, so sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm a you know mid 20 year old kid that still lives in his parents' basement. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the like times my mom has come to visit me, she's like stayed longer, obviously, because she doesn't have to like go, you know, she's working remotely. And I always get so sad when she leaves because she like helps with my laundry and like <laughs> I was like, what do you want for lunch? Like, yeah, it's it's Best. embarrassing how much I like welcome that and still want that at this age. Wow. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Without a Roadmap. This is the podcast for product folks who don't know all the answers. I'm joined here by my co-host, Cameron Curry. Hello, everybody. Today, we're joined by a very, very special person. Her name is Lauren. She's, I think her main title or her primary title is Customer Engagement Manager or Senior Customer Engagement Manager. Did I get that right? You got that right. Yeah, the second Perfect. one, Senior Customer Engagement Manager. Hey, everyone. Perfect. So today we have Lauren here to continue our customer success one-on-one series. Um, today will be a little different take since Lauren's title is senior customer engagement manager, manager and that's success. So I wanted to dive in into the differences or similarities with, within that role or within that title and to see um, more about how you drive customer engagement since that is a major topic within the whole customer success branch and also product stuff as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think about my role, uh, well, first of all, I'm at Uplevel. It's a a company for engineering effectiveness. We're a startup, less than 20 folks. So similar to the parlor team, which is why I love working with them so much. Um, But my job is to really figure out what do customers love in our product? What do they keep coming back for? And what do they not love? Um, And figuring out how to work cross-functionally with teams to really drive that change that ultimately leads to high engagement. So the reason it's customer engagement is because I'm thinking not only about delighting our customers and making sure we meet their goals, but also about driving user engagement in the product. Since we're a B2B SaaS platform, we've got to make sure we keep all those users happy, but ultimately the customer who's signing the paycheck and the one that we connect with most often. So it's a cool blend of kind of, I would say there's product management in that um, and that I'm trying to understand user needs and inform roadmap, but also the customer success side of meeting with customers. What are their goals? Where does up level fit into their, their goals? So, um, and in being a startup, you know, of course, there's 20 other hats that I wear a lot. Those may us too. Right. Yep. <laughs> Before we dive into a little bit more about your role, kind of talk or walk us through how you got to Uplevel. Because I think I was talking to your LinkedIn. I believe you are a product marketing manager before. So how did you make the switch from, from that role um, into this customer engagement role at, uh, at Uplevel? Yeah. So I'll take it like even further step back to kind of the beginning of my journey at my previous company. I was at a employee engagement tech company and I was there for about four years, um, actually started in a totally different role. Um, my background is in data analysis. So I was looking at different processes in the business and trying to find improvements, um, in a really data driven way, um, which is ultimately what led me. I'll get there in a quick sec. Uh, While I was at my previous company, I actually started our first women's group. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about diversity and inclusion. um, And that actually essentially kicked off me leading diversity and inclusion internally for the full company. But actually that then led into a product that we made a part of our employee engagement offering. So essentially what I was doing internally, our CEO said, hey, I want to package that up and sell it. And I became the leader of that product. So similar to what I'm doing now, where I was understanding the market, what do people care about with diversity inclusion? What kind of tools would they buy? And how could our product meet that? And what other features do we need to build? So I did that for several years. It was an amazing experience being in this cross-functional role between product sales, customer success, and really figuring out how to package up and market this product. And then I just came to this point in my career where I was just ready to work on a different problem. And uh, 
I made the hopefully not stupid and also very risky decision to <laughs> leave my really wonderful, stable company and join a startup during the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and the reason I landed at up level is like I mentioned, kind of my background in data analysis and just a love for helping teams thrive. Um, and so I still feel like I'm bringing my principles of diversity and inclusion to this role today, just in a like specific focus on engineering teams. So up level really fit, uh, I would say my prior skill set and what I learned in that product marketing role, but was letting me do it on kind of a broader scale um, at a company that I believe is going to really grow and take off. That's an amazing answer. <laughs> that, that I Cam must have known that the story, uh, you know, fit in really well. Um, that's that's super interesting, especially being able to start, um, you know, basically spin out a an activity or you know something you're passionate about, kind of running internally at your last company into a product that they could sell. Uh, I that might be a, a, a conversation for a separate episode, though. Um, I definitely would like to to look into that. You know, it's like yeah. Build- MVP internally and testing it with your own team. And I think about that. That's a lot of what we're doing at Parlor and kind of using our product and, and only kind of leveraging what we learn from our usage and into what we sell. Yeah. I'm ha- happy to cover that story. Lots of lessons learned in that good and bad. So <laughs> yeah, we can say that one for a later date. <laughs> Uh, so going, but like kind of transitioning back to, to customer engagement. Um, I, 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 from the limited amount that I've learned, uh, well, a lot of what I've learned about customer success has come from the series. So thank you to all the uh, the prior guests. Uh, but a lot of what uh, I've learned about it is that engagement, driving engagement, is one of the um, like you know primary goals of a of a customer success manager. Obviously, that's tied to driving up sales and and uh, renewals. But engagement is kind of core to all of that. Um, so I, I'm curious your thoughts on on how your role diverges from like a classic CSM role and, and you know, where like the engagement being at the center of it, um, you know, allows for, you know, all, all these new, if whether or not it allows for like a, a number of new responsibilities in this role, or if it's just a more focused version. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, And maybe this is my internal optimist, but I actually think that it's a better place to be because in my role, I feel even closer to product. I know at previous companies and in previous roles, uh, traditional CSM, they're really focused on like delighting that customer or like really focused on the account and whoever is that main person, again, kind of for lack of a better way to put it, signing the check. Um, so sometimes they don't actually always get to interact with the users a lot, but in my role, I would say the user is my first customer. Um, it's who I'm thinking about, um, when I, you know, initially like launched the product and there's executives on the call, it's talking about how might managers and developers use this product. Um, and I think knowing that that's my first customer and then obviously the like executive or main buyer is, is a really close second. Um, That allows me to stay really close to what users want in the product and be able to work really closely with our product and engineers to build that and better communicate clearly what users really need. Um, So I would say I'm really lucky with this focus of engagement because I think it allows me to hyper focus on building a product that I know people are going to use because I hear it straight from their mouths of like, this is what I need um, to really use this at my job. So since you're probably spending most of your time either with the user or the product team. What's like the interaction between you and um, the director of product? I'm, forget- I'm blanking on his name, Dave? Yeah, Dave Matthews. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah Dave, nice work. Dave Matthews. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, Dave I, Matthews. It's kind of hard to forget once yeah. you actually hear it. It's <laughs> no not relation. the actual Dave Matthews, just oh. so everybody listening knows. Um, no, he is uh, also a really cool guy though, our Dave Matthews at all. Yeah, he has the, the nice hair and everything. I, I yeah. Like it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. So back to like, like what's your interaction with, between you and Dave, right? So since you're, your first customer is the user, I'm assuming you try to put yourself in the user's shoes when you're seeing um, Dave work on new product features and uh, releases and things like that. So like, what's that interaction like during the product development life, uh, life cycle? Yeah, so it happens in a couple like really tangible ways where I attend every sprint planning. Um, and as they're talking about what they're working on, 
you know, Dave might say like something's getting close to release and I can say, Hey, I'd love to like run it by a few users. So it's really attending the regular meetings that Dave leads or that the engineering team has um, to make sure that I'm in the know and then offering up to him like, Hey, let's go chat with users. Um, so that's kind of how we interact on a regular basis. Uh, we also really leverage Slack a lot. And after customer meetings, we post notes in there, Dave reviews those and we might tag and say like, Hey, what's the status on adding this one feature? Um, I will say like now officially working with Parler and having Parler as a tool, like that has totally brought a new level to our relationship. So we actually now have a bi-weekly meeting where we're going to review the Parler insights and it'll happen before a sprint retro so that we know like what users are saying before we start to prioritize what's next. Um, so that's been really helpful. He's actually, I'm not kidding you, blowing up my Slack right now, asking about <laughs> renaming user themes um, and user needs because we're trying to like really get it set up to then show it to the rest of the product and engineers. So I would say in a way we've kind of become co-owners would be the like summary to your question of how we work together as co-owners of the user voice in that I'm the one amplifying the voice and Dave is the one figuring out where it fits into the process. Nice. I love, I love the parlor shout outs, especially. <laughs> I know. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we love yeah. it. We love it. Um, on that point, when you, when you said, um, like, Hey, you want to uh, show us like some designs or some early ideas to customers that are about to be worked on. Like what's that process? Like, obviously, we know Parler has tools to help you that in the future, but what have you historically done um, with Dave and maybe even at your previous company if that applies to? Yeah, a couple of ways I've done that. Um, so at a previous company, we focus a lot on focus groups. So either like those that are like professionally hired. Um, so there's like some marketing firms that they, you know, they get together a cohort of people that will answer a bunch of questions for you. Or we actually asked F experts in the space to look at the product and give feedback. What we've been doing historically at up level is because we're small and um, we have some of those early adopter customers, we've just been meeting like one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls with folks for like 30 minutes. Um, and I ask them a bunch of questions. Dave may show them a couple mock-ups. So we really rely on that in-person interaction today or you know, in-person in the COVID world, the Zoom meeting um, to ask for feedback. Um, we've tried to do like quarterly surveys, but it, honestly, it's been really hard to get people to respond. Um, I'm going to be curious to hear if other people on the podcast have shared that same challenge of getting user feedback or just user satisfaction scores where everybody's being bombarded with things digitally and a lot of noise. Um, so I feel like our, our, what's really been successful for us is just reaching out to people on Slack or via email and getting them to sit down with us for 30 minutes and look at mockups. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that's something that was actually the one of the first tools uh, that we built at Parlor was a tool called previews and is basically concept validation and you have access to this so this might be interesting to you but it essentially allows you to share uh, mock-ups or uh, you know it could be as simple as a screenshot or even a prototype like a fully like you know uh, hot queued prototype with your users and then do a, you know like a con uh, um, what we call a user heuristic analysis survey after it and um, it was it was really in the weeds and wasn't really easy to market you know it's basically only UX teams would use it but um, I think it's one of those nice things that every once in a while there is somebody in a really specialized role like yours who's actively doing this sort of concept validation trying to figure out exactly you know how to drive engagement and make sure that wh exactly what you're building is is you know what your users need and um, so you know I don't know if Cam has, has demoed you on that one but uh, I think you might find that interesting. Yeah I could see I, I think we even talked about that with some of our front-end developers um, when we were talking about installing the snippet and they like were responding back, of course, in Slack saying this could really help us with rapid iteration. Cause one of like the kind of downsides of meeting with people one-on-one -on -one over Zoom is where we've been kind of been waiting to this till we get to this point where we have something we're about to ship um, because they're, they're current users. So they're gonna see it and they're gonna say, well, when can I have it? So if it's like something that's so far-fetched it's not always a great fit to show users um, to like take up, you know, 30 minutes of their time. So 
I could see us really using that feature when we're just trying to get like early quick feedback on are we even heading in the right direction, which as you all know, being in a startup is like, that's like the lifeblood is <laughs> getting right. that, that feedback of like, Hey, you're, you're heading in the right direction. You're helping me solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I'm curious, uh, a, a little bit about your, your product marketing background. And I'm curious what the, um, you know, kind of overlap or how it's helped you in this new role. I think of, you know, it being super valuable and being able to explain exactly how the product works in like, you know, unique and interesting ways to drive engagement. Uh, because sometimes, you know, they have what they need in front of them. It's just, uh, you know, requires like a, um, you know, unique or uh, persuasive way to explain them how to get the value. Um, so it's like in, in, in that line, like how, how do you get people to, to engage when, you know, the things that they want are, are already there but you know it's just they're having trouble finding you know the reason to use it or you know I don't know if you does that make sense yeah yeah it's like essentially like how do you market to current users when the thing is like right there in front of them <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. and like really call it out um yeah I mean I feel really thankful for this background of like being on a marketing team at my last company um I will also say like even going back to like high school and the things I've studied. Um, this is a bit of a tangent, but one of my friends is an English teacher and on Instagram, he posted like, well, you all share your stories of how English has benefited you in your career. So I can share it back with my seventh graders who don't care about it. And I like could have written a novel about like the value of learning how to communicate things. Um, like it's just so critical. And so I feel like, um, learning how to do that effectively, how to like message something is so important to user engagement. Um, and just figuring out how, like, even if you've already talked about something, how can you talk about it for the 20th time in a new way? Um, and I feel like marketing and especially my time in my previous role really gave me that ability of like, how do you introduce new stats that could catch them? And like, oh, I've never thought about that. Or like, use customer stories or use cases. Um, so I feel like that's what a marketing background has helped me with. I also report into our VP of marketing and she has such a great skill set in this. And so having her as my partner to review all of our user comps has been massively helpful because she just has that eye for like succinct messages that can really draw users in. But the like short, that was a long winded answer to say like, so important to like, gain some skills in communication and marketing and any sort of user role, because you've just got to get them back into the tool. Right. And sometimes you don't have any new tricks. And so it's <laughs> all about just the just language. Get creative. Yeah. yeah. I, mm -hmm. I feel like English gets a bad rap um, as, you know, not being a serious major in college and, and totally. high school, but it's literally the only uh I feel like the only field of study that has transferable skills in tech, unless you're an engineer, you know, <laughs> yeah. like it, writing well, communicating effectively. Like I, I can't, I can't point to you know any of the poli sci classes that I took for my major as being. Right. Used, so take yeah, your English seriously. classes, guys. I think like when I first started okay. parlor and we were doing like all the blog and marketing stuff, I was like, dang, I probably should like minor in communications because like it's that's so much more relevant to what I do on a daily basis now mm -hmm. than like any yeah. like finance. 102 or 101 class there i don't even know those calculations anymore i couldn't like <laughs> calculate the loan or in like the principal you're paying on interest it's that's that's what the internet's for for nowadays <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so bottom line is for any college students and or high school students listening to this like take those classes seriously because yeah you're so right they're so transferable mm -hmm. back to like the customer marketing stuff um Actually, we had a conversation with Keith either last, this week or the week before um, just about how to do like more or just better customer marketing. So I'm curious to see like, what, like what's your take on that? Because I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of new like either startups or existing companies are now um, incorporating like those customer marketing materials into like their product announcements, whether those be like case studies or like tips and tricks. So one of this, like this here, like, your take on um, if you, if you think that's valuable in a role like yours and how often or frequent somebody should be doing that. Yeah. In, I mean, the short answer is I think it's super valuable 
mainly because if you're building that relationship and proving the value throughout your whole relationship, by the time the renewal comes around, it isn't this like massive effort to try and say, Hey, here's why you need us. Like you've been trickling that throughout the whole relationship. So I see that being a a really big value add to customer marketing. Um, So for, for us and what we do being B2B and our user type, you know, we kind of have two different, I would say, forms of customer marketing. The first is I would say what our VP of marketing, my boss owns, which is like sending out emails to our customers. Mm -hmm. And these are like, Hey, we've studied this new topic around COVID and the amount of deep work engineers are getting. Um, And so it's just keeping us relevant and top of mind for them. Whereas my role is again, kind of the user marketing side, which I'd say is more marketing features um, and trying to get them to see like the way they use the product. So they're just a little bit different, but I think, I mean, I'd be curious if you guys have talked to anybody else or in your role, um, have to kind of do two separate customer marketing efforts, like marketing to the person who's your buyer and like marketing new features to your users. Um, and I think there's some content that overlaps, but not all of it, right? Cause you don't want like every single user to get content on, you know, your marketing content. Cause it might push them away. Right. Right. That makes a ton of sense. As I think, um, probably in the same boat as, as you know, um, with the person that's signing the checks and the people that are actually using, um, the product day in and day out or getting the most frequent use of probably similar to the up level. I think if I remember your use cases mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hundred percent correct. Like you don't want, or you kind of have to segment the different types of marketing materials you're using. So maybe when you're sending those emails and marketing stuff to like the executives or the people, or the decision makers or the buyer, the buyers, you have like materials focused more on how the tool makes your team or like your company more efficient and better and how that also benefits them in the long run. Whereas for the actual people using your product day in and day out, it's more so materials of like tips and tricks of how to best use the platform to make their jobs a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like, it's, you know, in customer success, you always try and like take a page out of other people's books and the companies (laughs) that have done it really well, but this is not something that's consistent, right? Like I think about, you know, our HR tool, Like if I got a marketing email from them, I'd be like, that's super weird. I, even though I'm like a user of this, like I wouldn't want to get that. Might get a little nervous too. It's like, oh. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. But if I get an email from Zoom, a marketing email from Zoom, even though I'm not like the main customer, but I'm like using it as being a part of Uplevel, like that makes sense to me. Cause I'm like, oh, they're giving me tips on how to run effective Zoom meetings. So it's not like there's like a hard and fast rule um with b2b SaaS, um at least i haven't seen it i don't know if you guys know it either but yeah i think that would be something like figuring out the right balance um is something that i think we're still identifying like what content should users get over customers where can it overlap and when do you need to kind of protect users and not create a lot of noise for them and same with customers not create a lot of email noise for them too Mm. Kind of along that line, like, let's say you're working with a customer and you've kind of, you, you think you've satisfied their needs in terms of uh, the value that they were hoping to get from your product. And you've provided the tools that you're just mentioning, the, the, you know, marketing materials, the educational information, you know, so they have everything they need, but they're, they're not engaging. So in your experience, like what's, what's the next step there to, to get uh, an inactive user or customer back on the hook when it seems like everything should be going right for them. Mm. Oh yeah. That's a tough one. Um, well, I think it's kind of my like immediate reaction to that is kind of taking a little bit of like dose of humility of like, okay, up level is not the only thing that's happening in their day. Um, so like what other things, and I'm particularly thinking about customers, like, is there a big like reorg that they're going through that's actually like limiting them from really being able to make time for it or see the value or whatever it may be. So I think there's a little bit of like humanizing and empathy of, Hey, checking in with them with a customer and seeing, you know, what's going on. Like, are we communicating enough? Is there something going on in the organization? Um, I think it's just checking in, not assuming it's not because they don't see the value, but recognizing that everybody's balancing a lot. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's where my mind goes immediately from the customer lens. Um, And then I think like also again, in the same light of humility too, like maybe you could think you're doing all the right things, but you actually just haven't asked the right questions to the user or customer to know if those are actually the things that they really care about or are the biggest barriers in their day. And so even if you think you've solved it or know what those are, like checking back in, I think is really important and um, like never kind of cutting off that level of communication. And, you know, I reach out to users all the time and I get rejected all the time by rejection. I just get ghosted Um, (laughs) and then I'll just try again. And you know, maybe get a taker the next time. But I think it's just about like kind of, you know, I pointed to this earlier shedding ego and checking in and saying, hey, we're we're a young startup. We're trying to make it. Can you give me 30 minutes to sit down? And that um, that's kind of what I, the tactics I've tried so far. <laughs> mm. and yeah, same here. That's like the very similar approach that I've taken. And I'm always surprised that by how much time people are actually willing to give you, uh, especially, you know, when it's, you know, just a, a product person at a team that they're working for. Um, yeah, like I, I personally don't know if I would have been as open to, to loaning my time out as, as much as folks are for us, but it's it's great. And <laughs> I think that has that, that's something to say about the product. Like people are excited about what we're working on, want to help out. Yeah, oh, for sure. Totally. And doesn't now that you're like, now that you're in this position, if you were to ever move on and be in like more of the position of the buyer or user, you're like way more willing to give that feedback. Like I oh, answer yeah. almost every email feedback survey <laughs> yeah. just for karma. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mary, I'll be, I'm definitely more empathetic, you know, especially since, you know, I, I do do some like re- outreach to folks who I think would be yep. a good fit. You know, <laughs> I'm just like, ah, like you guys would look like you really need parlor. And, you know, so when, when I get, when I get the, like a rogue, you know, sales message, you know, I used to, you know, delete it, unsubscribe, but, you know, in, in a lot of cases, I'll, I, you know, mostly it's, it's still no, but it's like, Hey, <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I see you, you're hustling, but yeah. it's, it's just, it's, yeah. just, it's not, it's not going to work. <laughs> if, if you don't respond, at least got to get an open just so they get their, their metrics up a little bit. <laughs> we, we know they're getting tracked by opens yeah. now. Right. Right. They're probably, experience. <laughs> probably messing them up, you know, just giving them false hope, but uh, uh, that's also yeah. true. so maybe yeah. I, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. I wanted that I wanted to get into this was one topic that's super interesting for Parlor and then also that you brought up yourself, Lauren, is the balance of the user voice versus the customer or their account voice and like which one is most important and which one to prioritize. That's going to be um, super relevant to Parlor in the coming months. And so this can kind of act as a mini user interview on the spot. <laughs> live. <laughs> We're efficient um, with our time here. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, well, I work for an engineering like effectiveness platform and, you know, we get efficiency and user <laughs> feedback and all that stuff. So I respect it. Um, well, just so you know, I'm going to turn this question back on you because I don't think that I've cracked this nut, but I can share a little bit about what I think. Um, so, you know, customer voice, I view as like the loudest. And I also view the customer voice as kind of the decision maker at the beginning. But then the user voice is like, it's like that, why it's the wider audience and sometimes is more depth, right? Um, but they're usually the ones that are going to ultimately make the decision about the renewal, which as we know, in, in SAS, like, we really care about that renewal and getting those customers that just stay on for several years. So you don't have all those expensive costs of getting them in the tool and acquisition costs. Um, so for me, like balancing the user voice, knowing that is super, super critical. Um, I also think, you know, I know you're using this a little bit of a user feedback session. I feel like it's a little bit easier to close the loop with your customers in terms of feedback. Cause you can just send them an email and say like, Hey, on our last call, you brought up this idea, just to let you know, that's in our backlog. It's a lot harder to do that with several hundred users to close the loop with them. Um, but it's like equally as important. So that's something that I feel like is a gap for us today. Um, is even though we like ask for a lot of user feedback, um, I think we're like missing the step of being able to close the loop with users. Um, And that's like kind of a miss and something I hope we can get better at because then I think it just 
that like kind of like a reinforces for them like hey we value you we're listening to you we hear you and I think they're more likely to give feedback in the future or they're more likely to give feedback to who's ever signing the check at the end of the term of like hey I really love this tool they're working with their team is great I made this suggestion and they implemented it they're a lot more likely to kind of go to bat for you um, when it comes to renewal if you can like say we see you, we're listening to you, we're building features that align with your needs. Um, so I would say they're both super important, but the user voice is more important ongoing, but really listening to the customer and delivering on those things early in the process is really critical too. Um, but when it comes to roadmap planning, like which feature comes first and which do you invest more in? Like, I don't know. And that's where I'd turn it back to you guys. Like, what have you seen with other customers when you've got one person, the person who signs the check saying, I desperately need this thing, but 200 users all saying this thing would be really helpful. Like which one ultimately wins out? Um, I don't know. I kind of gave a ph philosophical answer, but that's like a very practical question that I don't know if I know the answer to. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is a tough one. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm in the camp that you kind of take each piece of feedback and, you know, in the way that you address it is going to be unique depending on the situation. Like, you know, at an earlier stage company, it's easier to think that way, or, you know, you don't have thousands of different inputs to try and, you know, filter and sort through in order, you know, just develop a score so that you can make a decision and keep it moving. And it's like here, we can kind of really sit through and, and you know, make a, a conscious kind of uh, decision based on a lot of different different variables. But in general, um, I think, you know, I agree with what you were saying, uh, the customer upfront, you know, in the process of kind of closing a deal, you're going to have to like provide them with what they need to, to kind of keep them happy. And, you know, but at the end of the day, I think the, um, you know, support of those end users who are using your product on the front lines day to day, uh, they're the people who are going to go to bat for you, like you said. And, um, you know, I think that, trying to, to make sure that the um, experience is, you know, valuable and, you know, useful for them is, is like, should be uh, the primary goal, but with kind of the caveat that you do have to keep in mind that the person signing the checks is, is um, uh, the decision maker. Uh, but yeah. I think it's a balancing act. Uh, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer of like you, you know, choose one or the other. I, I think it's definitely a spectrum and it's going to depend on a number of factors, but in my mind, I, I side with the, the user. That's well yeah. balancing act. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll, maybe to add to that, it's, I think in terms of like the example where you have like one, maybe super high value amount customer requesting one thing that's critical to their business or to their use case or daily workflow. And then you have on the other hand, like 300 users requesting one similar thing. I think that is like the art of product, right? Like there's no scientific way to say, hey, this is going to give you the highest chance to succeed. It's more of just like Jonas said, the balance and act in the art of doing product management and having to decide and make those decisions and live with the consequences based on what you decide as a team to move forward. So sometimes for the highest paying uh, account, maybe you do build that first because that's super relevant to your own business and the health of your own business. Whereas for the users requesting that one feature, maybe that's where like those customer marketing materials can come into play, right? Mm -hmm. So say that's something that you haven't built yet, but there's there's a way to get to what they're requesting, but it may not be the best process or maybe like hidden behind five different pages within your product, but you can still get to that same um, outcome they want to get. And so maybe it's providing ways or you send a mass email communication like, hey, we have a bunch of people requesting to do X, Y, Z. It's on our roadmap. Um, we'll, we'll build it. But in the meantime, you can use this workflow to accomplish the same goal. We get it. We understand it may not be the best um, experience, but we, we're working on solving this for you all. So I think that's kind of just the art of doing product and also the art of how product and customer facing teams work together. Yeah, that's a really good ad. Yeah, appreciate that, Cameron. I appreciate it. I think um, to, kind of, to kind of end things, one of the last topics you mentioned how you joined um, Elf Level during a global pandemic. So maybe just we talked about it when we were just um, just chopping it up before we actually started the podcast is maybe just ending with how connecting with customers during COVID and also prospects has you think changed or, and maybe have improved for the better. Yeah. Um, 
Well, one of the things that we, I mean, first of all, I will just acknowledge that it's hard. And I, even though I'm a homebody and I'm really adapting to remote work, I really miss things like conferences um, and getting to connect with customers there and really like, I just feel like there's so much value in that. And so mm-hmm. I will say that it's really hard and I look forward to the time where we can get back to a little bit more, even if it's going to be a hybrid for a while. Um, but some things that we're trying that actually have been really awesome. We did our first customer advisory board a couple of weeks ago. And so we had like a pretty you know, majority of our customers all attend a zoom call and it was for two hours. So that's a like pretty significant investment on zoom. Um, and they almost all stayed the whole time in some ways that we, some things that we did to really make sure it was going to feel like a really fruitful two hours of their day is we started with like a really personalized introduction. So we asked them what their first job they had was, um, and just like the smiles and just like Taking the notes. connections with people, <laughs> That's a good it one. Was, yeah. <laughs> we learned that like one of our customers had been a smoke jumper at one point, um, Excuse which me? It's the people that like jump out of airplanes to go fight forest fires. And she's now in engineering operations at this like massive company. Wow. Um, yeah. So that was, <laughs> yeah, super, super cool to learn. And I think it was just, you know, we were talking about this earlier, just being human. And um, so like opening it up to a question that like tapped into your childhood was like a really easy way to do that. And then we asked them what they were struggling with in COVID as well. And so that was like an immediate way for people to start to connect on a business need level um, and get ideas from folks. And then we were really intentional about how we set up the activities and our team, um, our CTO, Dave, our product manager, and our VP of marketing all led activities where we were getting feedback from them. And we made it super interactive. We had a Miro board, we had Google Sheets, we showed mock-ups and we changed the medium of every activity like every 20 minutes. Um, and so I feel like there's ways that you can kind of create that interactive feel now. So that was one thing that I feel like paid off exponentially um, was that customer advisory board and like making that intentional time for everybody to get together. On a day-to-day basis, like we've been leveraging Slack a lot, like just Slack messaging, just being more informal with customers um, hopping on 15 minute calls to give them updates versus trying to like have these like formal set in stone, regular meetings. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier too, on our zoom calls, just like asking about, you know, if we see a dog in the background, like opening up that conversation, you hear a kid scream, like, I think you've seen uh, Coco walk into my room, my dog. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. And like that, I think those things of like not ignoring it, but actually welcoming that as a way to build a relationship have been things that we've done. But um, yeah, I think it's just about over communicating, being human and honestly kind of being informal in a way and just really being real with people and our CEO and leadership team does a really good job at that. I've learned a lot from them of just like being themselves and owning that rather than trying to pretend to be this big, stale bureaucratic company that we're just not. Mm -hmm. Well put. That was an excellent answer. (laughs) Thank you. And a great way to, to end the podcast, Lauren, we appreciate you hopping on one of our favorites here at parlor. And we'll oh, have to <laughs> we'll, we'll have to get you back on in the future to make a, a second episode in, in a future series we do. Yeah, I'd love that. Well, this has been super fun. My palms aren't sweaty anymore. I got over my nerves. So. <laughs> there we go. We told you you do great. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate you both. This is a great discussion. I honestly learned some things from the both of you in this conversation. Um, so appreciate that very much. Sure. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, yeah, happy to have you on board the parlor train. And if you're listening, be sure to like and subscribe so that Casey doesn't yell at us again since we forgot last time. (laughs) I'll say it again to make up for that. Like and subscribe, please. There we go. Yeah, that's (laughs) it. Take care, everybody.